when I started um, manual uh, treatments, I looked back to another kind of work because originally I started after my years at the University in Munich, Aix-en-Provence and Hamburg after my university years. I started to work in the field of psychotherapy and I studied various schools over a period of five years. And then I had the feeling I rather want to do some work that is done by the hand with the human organism instead of psychotherapy. So that was my starting point. Then I went first to the Institute of Ida Rolf in the United States and studied her approach to work with the all over system of the fascial system of the human body. And after a few years, I also became an instructor there. And uh, 10 years in the field of manual work, I met um, Jean-Pierre Barral the first time and became a student of him. I would say, aside of uh, a few people in the United States, Jean Weberal was the strongest influence to my work uh, because he opened a completely new dimension of perceiving the human body. When I started working, most people would work mainly with the craniosacral system or uh, with the articular system, structural system of the human body and the joints. And um, his work, with the viscera, with the organs, was revolutionary to me. I had learned to work just with the fascial system, and I started to really get fascinated by his approach, doing manual work with the viscera, later also doing manual work with the arteries, with the veins, with the nerves, and finally even the brain itself. And um, I was his assistant, over a period um, of 29 years, once or twice a year, just a simple table assistant in his courses, helping to teach on a practical level. And that was, I would say, the most strong influence I've ever had in the manual field. I saw another few great teachers, but the influence I got from Jean Weberal was certainly the most convincing for me. I think um, that the characteristics of Baral's work is that he focuses on almost microscopic units in all fields of the human physiology. And, but he works in a very, very efficient way how small units show motion restrictions, and he treats that. He has however, always encouraged me uh, to go my own way. And he actually encouraged me to go to the States and said, you also have to give something. You should teach your own stuff, not only the stuff that you understood for myself. And my stuff is um, pretty much influenced by the old tradition of Ida Rolf, of course, in a very individual version of myself and influenced by various schools of osteopathy. But I try to show on an efficient level, that same efficiency what we know from Baral's work in the world of micro units of the body, I think I want to show how efficient that can be done also with larger units in the body, with a spacious, I would call it the volumetric arrangement of all the different cavities of the body. So it is a little bit more, my, what I want to add to that, what I learned from Jean Barberal is, it has a little bit more with the way how the underlying psychological attitudes shape the whole human structure, the human posture, and the way how people move and breathe. So it's more also about the larger units of the body, but of course, what I have really learned from Jean-Pierre Barral, we should never forget the significance of the small units. <clears throat> My understanding of scoliosis um, developed and changed during the last um, yeah, 38 years. And um, at the beginning, I thought that the scoliosis is mainly manifested in spinal curvatures and in the way how also the biochemistry of certain parts of the vertebrae of the spinal column have changed. 
Nowadays, I see that scoliosis uh, that shows in the back and in the spinal curvatures is only a very, very small part of the scoliotic universe inside the human body. And I try to find certain typologies. So I would say, for me, it's most important to see how the scoliosis manifests differently in the different cavities inside the body, the intraperitoneal cavity, the intrathoracic cavities, the intracranial subdivisions done by membranes, and also the spacious imbalances between the intraperitoneal space, the retroperitoneal space, and the subperitoneal space. So it's a very three-dimensional approach to scoliosis and the spine and the back are only a small part of it. I would say there are very, very clear thoracic scoliosis, a little bit compensated by curvatures in the lumbars and in the, inside the pelvis, but there are very clear pelvic and lumbar scoliosis related to counter curvature in the thorax. And there are sometimes scoliosis which are mainly present in the um, inside of the cranium, cranial spaces. However, a very clear type are those types which are rooted in a motion restriction and a spatial displacement of certain organs. For example, the stomach or the liver or the kidneys or the heart especially. So there is a whole variety of types and we have to approach them in our manual treatment quite differently. In teaching this course, I want to help the colleagues to learn a very, very clear step-by-step -step system of manual analysis of scoliotic types also related to age groups like pre-puberty, during puberty, after puberty, or adult people, and also in the small infant. I want to teach people that it's possible to make an absolutely clear analysis of those different types of scoliosis, and that we have to make the right choice, the right approach for each type of scoliosis. We need different modalities of touch for different kinds of fascia, for different kinds of membranes, and for different age groups. That's the goal of the course.